Well, well welcome to today's webinar. Um, I uh, have a lot of experience making cheddar. I'm actually, it's actually a joke that I put out frequently because when I grew up here in Vermont, um, what I realized was there was something called Vermont cheese that was sold everywhere. It was in all the tourist stores, in the general stores, and uh, it essentially was cheddar cheese. So my joke is that if I'm a Vermont cheesemaker, I certainly should know how to make cheddar cheese. And I came up with this idea to do this webinar because I've really, I've done lots of webinars now in my career over all kinds of subjects. And it just occurred to me that, you know, I've never actually tackled the subject of cheddar cheese making and because and it's very compl complicated actually and so um what i want to do today is introduce you to the practice of making cheddar and then um, some of the steps that we go through to make the cheese and how they affect the qualities of the cheese but first let's uh let's do let's do a history lesson um, I do think it's important to uh, know where the cheese has come from. It sort of gives you a sense of the, the place um, and the type of dairying they did and um, the techniques they used to make cheese. Uh, it turns out that the cheddar is, uh, it comes from a, uh, a place actually on the name, but, and it wasn't, actually uh, a place where they made cheese it was it was a little village that had amazing scenery these this gorge and people would travelers would come there way back in the 18th century um, from the more urban areas for a nice time in the country and but it was also in somerset which was the heart of some of dairying in england and uh Somerset and Cheshire counties, as you just saw on the map there. And so uh, they would come here and actually in the shop, in the village, they could buy the local cheese, which was began to be called cheddar because of the village they bought it in. Um, and these were very large wheels uh, of cheese and that signified high quality. The only way you could make a cheese that big uh, was if you could make a hard cheese that didn't weep moisture that you know was properly fit for aging. And uh, we'll find out uh, more about that as we go on here. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a history lesson and then I'm gonna get into um, four major ways of making cheddar, the, the approach a cheesemaker would take. Um, and then uh, we'll finish up with the links to the steps in cheddar making and quality. And I'll just tell you that um, I'm planning to make a much deeper dive into cheddar making as a more technical webinar in the future. So I will be picking it apart very uh, carefully um, based on all my years making cheddar and also what I know about uh, how it's made still in Somerset, England, they're called the West County Cheesemakers. And then also we're going to be finding out how you all make it in Australia um, and comparing notes. So we have that to look forward to. But essentially, uh, the Puritans who were um, in uh, England, you know, and then they migrated to North America, they brought cheddar making with them. And as England became industrialized and its farming communities dwindled, they made less cheese. And the, the new colonies and then the United States had a chance to, to take uh, some of that market and they did. So in the early 19th century, they were going gangbusters. And in fact, New England and New York State, which is a, you know the Northeastern part of the United States, was the largest milk shed and largest producer of cheddar in the world. And uh, unfortunately for them, they uh, lost that market to 
not only you all in Oz, but the Canadians and the New Zealanders, because uh, they began to what was what was known as make filled cheddar. So they thought it was a good idea, being good American capitalists, to take some of the cream out of the milk, make the cheese, but then fill that fat back with either vegetable oil or lard. And they, they, it was disguised pretty well as it aged in the early stages, but anytime it got past a few months, it began, it began to go rancid and, and it was a big scandal. And that was the reason why the United States lost its market. So let's turn to the essential heart of cheddar, which is how it was made in Somerset going way back to the 18th century and strongly through the 19th century, women made it. These were the dairy maids and they were very good at it. They had empirical knowledge. They used their senses, their uh, nose, their taste and their feel to uh, ascertain when to move on through the steps of cheese making. And they knew how to make a good cheese, many of them. Um, knew how to do this quite well. Of course, the, the, you can imagine back in those days with milk not being, you couldn't cool milk. So uh, they would let the evening milk stand overnight and blend it after skimming it, uh, some cream out of it, depending on, you know, they knew enough by the end of the 19th century to, to tell how much fat was in the milk and they could pretty accurately take take the cream out to make the fat content where they wanted it to be relative to, uh, to making a good cheese. So that was part of the process and then it would be blended with the morning milk. But this milk being ripened overnight was pretty active with bacteria. It was all raw milk cheese. And some of these dairy women were really good at it and others were not as good. So there was a lot of variation. Um, so by 1880, you had uh, the factory uh, production had begun 20 years before. And so not everything was made on farms anymore. And milk was being collected from a few farms to be made into cheese in a larger facility that had more modern vats with uh, actually by the end of the 19th century, they had developed hot water uh, circulation and jacketed vats. Um, so, um, the English saw an opportunity to, to um, get back some of the market by making the highest quality possible. And that became their focus. There were three methods that were the, the most popular and drove the future of British cheese making. And they, were, they came from three different men, Joseph Harding, uh, Mr. Candy and Henry Cannon. And it was actually their daughters that uh, really uh, took took it on. They were the, the young people at the end of the century and they became some of them teachers and others like the Harding children, both the sons and daughters uh, actually went out in the world. And right here, we can see that not only were there these schools established, literally the first place to have cheese making schools was in Somerset and Edith Cannon, who became quite famous and Rachel really got a kick out of reading about her. She lived to be 94 and she passed in 1964, I think. Mm -hmm. So she was only 22 years old when she began teaching at this new school in Bath in 1891. And then we had the Harding children. He had something like, uh, like 12 children and uh, one son went to your country in the 1860s to teach his method of cheddar making. And I, I think that's name is right. Uh, Bodella, Australia. I, I read this in a book. So anyways, <laughs> by the end of the century, they were doing things like uh, uh, working hand in hand with uh, scientists, dairy, dairy scientists who were men. And uh, these men had developed the acidometer, a way to measure the amount of acidity in the whey, in the milk, in the whey. 
and they began like working with these women as the women tasted and uh, and 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 felt the the milk or the curd, you know, felt the curd to determine when it was ready to say mill and put the salt on. They were right there with the acidometer measuring that point, and they were trying to match these empirical, these practical skills that made great cheese good to great cheese with this new device. So uh, they were also investigating sources of milk taints, like why milk would have an off flavor. And this was the early, this was the real beginning of bacteriology. They were starting to select out different lots of milk and from individual cows or from the tank, uh, the, the cans that were delivered and prepare the first natural milk starter cultures because the women had been using whey uh, that had ripened from the previous day's cheese make overnight as a starter. That was in the parting and the, uh, um, particularly the cannon method were doing that. Whereas the candy method relied on natural ripening of the milk without starter. So this is really interesting because we got this page out of uh, one of the, you know, the books of the time, like Dr. Lloyd's observations. And here you have the, the, field, the different fields, the weight of the milk, they milked from the cows on that field because they were going out and milking in the pasture, the time. And then here's the temperature of the, of the evening milk as it bring, and the acidity as it's brought into the dairy to stand overnight. And then the next morning we see how the acid has increased all through and some increased a little more than others and the temperature dropped as the milk stood overnight. Very interesting stuff, I love this kind of stuff. Then we move, uh, move ahead and you can see these, these uh, innovations in equipment that, that help speed up the process and make things go a little faster. So instead of having to break the curd up by hand, the curd mill came along pretty early actually. Uh, cloth binding, interestingly enough, that helped prevent the cheese rind from cracking and spoiling uh, during aging came from the colonies uh, because they had the, uh, the cloth and they had a lot of it because they were growing a lot of cotton. And so that kicked in in the 18th century as well. Then, we, like I told you earlier, we had the new vats and we even had milk coolers that had agitators by the end of the 1800s. Not that many people were using them, but they were there. And finally, to make the cutting process go faster, which previously had been done with single bladed knife and what was called a shovel breaker, which was kind of like a saucer with a handle. And it took 15, 20 minutes, maybe you know even more to do it gently to cut the curd. You had the curd knives for the first time that could do it as just as nice a job, but much more quickly. So we're going faster and faster. Now we're moving away from the little factories and the farms and it becomes a large factory uh, process. And this was because of not just the development in equipment, um, but for the first time, commercially prepared uh, starter cultures were available. And that was revolutionary. Uh, and by toying around with the different strains of bacteria that were known to, to be best for cheddar making, the scientists could, could pick eventually some very fast acting strains that made this acid quickly and, they, and that revolutionized the whole industry. So we're gonna go on a little timeline here. Um, to show how these ingredients change things. So as early as 1875, Joseph Harding was bringing in standard strength calf rennet from Denmark made by Christian Hansen's, which still produces rennet and cultures. Um, Hansen's was the, and, and he really liked it because he didn't have to prepare it anymore by himself. And I know from having here at Parish Hill Creamery, Rachel and I make one cheese called Cornerstone, where we, we prepare our own rennet from the Vels. And they do vary in strength, and we do not have the same 
gel time or flocculation time from batch to batch. And so it's a little bit nerve wracking to make your own rennet. It, you can do it, you can still make good cheese, but I can see why when Harding began to go around, you know, showing his method and also talking about how you could um, alleviate some of this uh, uncertainty about how long it would take for a coagulation uh, by using this rennet that other cheesemakers began to jump on board. So even though Hansen started producing uh, powdered uh, cultures to make bulk starter with, these were not used by the cheesemakers right away like they were for the butter makers. And it was really mainly to inoculate cream to make butter. And also pasteurizing was kicking in on the cream at the time because these cultures worked really well in pasteurized cream to make a ripened uh, cream for butter making. Because back then they really liked the, you know, the cream was, was either skimmed from the morning milk, which meant it was already ripe, or it was whey, uh, cream from whey. So, uh, so you like that flavor, but then it took, you know, a couple, three decades before cheesemakers uh, began pasteurizing. Uh, uh, then the, you know, the scales tipped towards much more cheese being made from pasteurized milk than raw milk by 1939. And then of course the need for a good reliable starter. And so that they went hand in hand, pasteurizing and the commercial starter cultures. In 1950, uh, a company named Unigate um, began collecting the starters in Somerset that the cheesemakers were using to make their raw milk cheddar and uh, make them available to the cheesemakers so that the cheesemakers could, uh, didn't have to go through that every year to make their own. And they're still using them uh, in Somerset. The West Country cheesemakers are still using these starters called pint starters that are produced by barbers. But they're essentially 100 year old starters that, uh, that are integral in the identity of that West County cheddar. And then as we move into the modern era, of course, you all who are out there in the audience who are cheesemakers or who've read enough about it know that uh, the real common thing to use nowadays are direct fat inoculation starters. The final uh, advance, technological advance with the ones for cheddar was made in the late 80s and they were known as rapid acidification cultures. Um, which were the fastest of all to produce acid during the cheddar make. And that's what is used in really industrial cheddar making. So if we, if we start out back in England and we, we think about, you know, 1860, here we are, small factories just starting, a lot of farmhouse cheese, uh, the cheese class, you know, the, the, the sort of quality of the cheese was it had to age a minimum of 12 months. They did uh, make from time to time, you know, cheese that was uh, ready for sale in three months. And that was because the milk was, was already getting acid and they have to make the cheese very fast. And that meant that they had a high moisture cheese at the end of the day. So there weren't only just 12 month plus age cheeses. There was a variety of cheeses in the market. And, um, but the highest quality was known to have come from milk, you know, that didn't have taints and, uh, and was made in a very slow method, a slow progressive action. And this, the base of it all was this very good milk. And then you could get a good to great cheese. Um, you could, with using the starters, you know, as, as I've just explained, those came in to use more like from 1930 onward. Um, but even back in 1860, up to the turn of the century, they were still, they were using whey and even coagulated milk in cans held overnight in, in a warm temperature The you know, acid curd type uh, soured milk uh, to mix up and use a starter too. And they knew back then at the end of the 19th century that they could, with fast acidification, overcome some of the minor milk taints and produce a decent cheese they could still sell. So as we move into the present, you know, we have a little picture of the barber starters that the Somerset 
cheesemakers are, are using. And um, they, uh, they take these pint starters, which are the mother cultures, and then they prepare their bulk starters in-house. So by 1935, farmhouse to factory cheese production was one to seven. So it really had tipped uh, the other way. By, by 1956, there are only 140 farmhouse cheesemakers left. And I'm sure there are a lot more than that now because we're going, still going through this revolution of, of back to the farm, back to raw milk, and back to cheese that has a local flavor, a taste of place. Um, so the other thing that happened in the UK was, was they, uh, their whole dairy program industry shifted away from cheese making and went into fluid milk and more fresh dairy products. So by 1935, only 5% of the dairy production was cheese. So that meant they were buying in a lot of cheese from you guys, from New Zealand and uh, from Canada. So the, the, the long method use, you know, over -ripe, overnight ripening of the milk and the long method of making cheese began to be shortened because milk had, was now able to keep cold overnight and uh, with these reliable starters and with milk that had not already started to sour, they could use larger doses of starter and shorten the process down. But it's still relative to the industrial, as you'll see, um, it is, it's, it's still a rather long cheddar making process when you're talking five to six hours. Now, when we shift to the United States, we, we had uh, lots of small cheddar making factories before 1960. In fact, I live in a state where we still have two small factories. One has been in continuous operation since about 1860, and the other one went out for a while. The state bought it, and it's at a historic site, uh, and, and it's, it's been under operation making the stirred curd type uh, hard English cheese again uh, for the past 20 years. So we have this heritage right here in the Northeast. And you can just imagine before 1960, there, were, there was lots of cheese made. Uh, there still is lots of cheese made, but it's made by just a couple of large companies now. And then a smattering, several handfuls of, of us small scale makers. Um, but in the whole United States, Cheddar making is really important because of American processed cheese, you know, Kraft and Velveeta and all those brands that that are used in food service. Uh, cheddar is, a, is the main ingredient. Um, by 1970, a few cheesemakers began making raw milk cheddar again. So uh, that one of them was Shelburne Farms up in uh, northern Vermont. And that's where I learned to make cheddar. And in the 90s, I made cheddar there for four years. Um, most of the cheddar makers in the US use pasteurized milk, but like I said, there are a handful that make it from raw milk. And the standard time is now four and a half hours from adding your rennet to the milling of the curd. Adding the starter lengthens it another 30 to 60 minutes. So you're looking at you know, the time to, to get the salt starting added onto the, the curds is now going to be running up towards uh, five and a half hours or so, and then it's got to go on the press. And then we have a, another interesting aspect of, of cheddar making in the US, which is the American cloth bound cheddar. It started right here in my village with the aging of it. And it was made at Shelburne Farms. And, but what it's turned into is it's turned into a cheese that is really engineered for the American palate. So it's become a sweet tasting, somewhat nutty cheese made from pasteurized milk uh, with the appropriate cultures added to get that kind of flavor. So rather than, you know, like a, a heritage approach, this was more like a designed marketing approach to to make something that Americans would love. And boy, do they love it. Okay, so now let's start to compare the methods. So we've learned about the traditional method with the overnight holding of the, of the milk at a higher temperature, and then the use maybe of a whey 
uh, culture or a uh, milk culture. That natural method took a heck of a lot longer, almost twice as long as, as the methods, the other methods. I, I mentioned the West County Cheddar, and that's a slow food presidio that contains a bunch of these makers. These two brothers are, are, are the Trothan. Trothan, and they're, uh, they're making West County Cheddar and Care Philly uh, at, their, at their cheese uh, house. Uh, then we have the industrial, which is really the way I learned to make cheddar, which everyone makes in Vermont. There's no one really yet going to a slower method as far as I know. Uh, there, like I said, there are people making cloth bound cheddar, but they're not doing anything all that different other than changing the culture and following the same kind of approach that we all use here. And then finally, you know, when you've got the technology like enclosed vats, draining matting conveyors that uh, the curds go in, you know, as they're dra they drain as they're being uh, pumped into the draining matting conveyor, and then they go on these belts and go through a simulated cheddaring process automatically before being milled, brine salted, and then sucked up into a pressing tower. So that's the fastest way of making it. And that's down to four and a half hours from, these are all from starter to milling. So interesting, right? How different cheddar can be made. And that of course, as you will find out very soon, is, is gonna affect the quality. So here's just a, uh, you guys have this as a handout. I'm not going to pick this apart. This is for, that's going to be for my next lecture. But I did just want to illustrate the steps here. And you know, I've talked about milk treatment as we go into the modern era. Now it's cold milk, sometimes held for quite a while. The starter culture changes up. The the renting times are, are actually very much faster in an industrial versus uh, like even the modern traditional, um, they, uh, they um, are going to wait 45 to 50 minutes rather than just 30 minutes um, to make the summer set. And then the, the cut size is about the same, but you can see like the cutting time is so much longer in the old days before they actually got curd cutters. And if we move on, we'll see how the scalding temperatures range when you're working with raw milk, you can afford to scald at a higher temperature because you've got all the bacteria in the milk working for you versus a pasteurized milk approach over on the, the, the industrial and fast industrial. You have to be pretty careful about the temperature if you're just using mesophilic starters. But if you're using the rapid acidification starters that include a thermophilic, you can bump the temperature up and speed up the process. So the end result, you know, when we get to pressing is that we have cheese in the fastest way into uh, a vacuum bag and heading out to the cooler in about five hours versus the traditional way where it got three days uh, more of pressing because we have to bandage the, uh, the cheddar and then put it back on the press before we put it into the uh, cooler environment. And that's the same way it's done in Somerset still. Whereas the industrial way I learned, it goes into a vacuum bag and some companies do two shifts a day. So they're only having it on the press for about four out for, for four hours at the least. But you know, when they have to get another vat going and get that, uh, that's about all they get pressed. So, so it's very, very different in terms of, of how these cheeses come out. So this is a, a chart that illustrates either if you're using a pH meter to, to uh, monitor your process of cheese making or a, uh, a titratable acidity, uh, then you can see how uh, the middle curve is the one we want. That's the way I learned how to make it. So uh, we want to mill at a pH of 5.35. It's critical to drain at a pH of 6.15. And we have these, uh, you know, key points in the process, we have to hit these targets to make the cheddar turn out the moisture we want. And so it can age out into a sharp cheddar. You know, we don't wanna just make medium cheddar. When we have a fast make, it gets graded as a medium cheddar. We have a long make that's slower. If we can still obtain the, the degree of acidity or the pH that we want, we, we will probably grade that out for an extra sharp 
cheddar because it's just going to improve over time. It's going to be a drier cheese. So you can see how your decision making during the process or, or you know, what happens back actively but from the bacteria working in your milk will shape maybe the outcome of that cheese. And so, uh, so just keep this in mind as this is a very important aspect of making cheddar is to have these good uh, monitoring and knowing where your acidity is at all times. And you can see like this is the industrial US model. And, and if you were to, uh, what do you call it when you put something over the top? Overlay. Overlay uh, the West Country cheddar making, mm -hmm. they would be draining actually at a lower pH. That's something they like to do. And their cheddar making process would be a little bit shorter. It wouldn't be the hour and a half that's on here. But they would also end up at a um, higher titratable acidity at milling. They they like more like a 0.6. To, um, and even in, and so you'll see like we're gonna I'm just gonna go into that right now. Um, so here we go. So how do how do the ingredients affect composition and the sensory attrib attributes of the cheese? Well, there's so many things to think about. You know when you're making a cheese and. In cheddar, particularly, um, we can look down at where the starters are, and the you know the fast acid producing starters have this Streptococcus thermophilus in them, and they have very little Lactococcus cremorous. So this is going to produce a cheese that's pretty uh, mild flavored. It's going to get that acid developed very quickly, and um, they can scald it or cook at a bit higher temperature. Uh, they can also set the milk at a higher temperature to help the streptococcus to grow better and therefore they'll end up with the moisture they want but typically in industry they push the moisture content of the cheese to the maximum and they want to sell it and you know and have it in the stores at three months they grade it at 72 days and it should be in the shops uh, the grocery stores wherever at 90 days and then uh, they'll grade out you know, lots for uh, for longer hold and for what they call reserve, extra sharp, that kind of thing. But it's really integral with the choice of the starter in terms of what kind of flavor development you're going to get in a pasteurized milk cheese. So in the old, older industrial, you know, early part of the industrial era, the cheesemakers were blending their own starters from single strains that they grew up in their, 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 bulk starter making tanks and they used more cremorous which is not as fast an acid producer so even early industrial cheddar making here in the U.S. followed more along the lines of what had come from England and they weren't like trying to make the cheese as fast and the cremorous gives much more of, of the uh, rounded flavor in a cheddar and, and, and it diminishes sort of that fresh acidity that, that now cheddar seems to be uh, um, uh, defined by, yeah. Um, and anyways, um, now of course there are choices around rennets and, and rennets will all, all, each one will have its own effect on the cheese. And uh, just for example, uh, when I was uh, I, taking classes from some of these West country cheddar makers, uh, they do not like to use the, um, the anything but calf rennet. They feel like it adds, because it's more complex enzymatically, it, it, it's important to use it for the flavor of their cheese. If we look at the make steps, um, and, and here I just made some notes here, like for example, you know, you're, you're choosing to make your own bulk starter versus a direct vat inoculation. Well, now you're gonna notice faster acid development during uh, I mean, you're going to notice more steady acid development. If you're using direct vat inoculation, it'll go faster later on in the make. So that's something to look at. And then rennet, we should be changing the amount of rennet we use based on what the acidity is when we're going to be adding the rennet. Nowadays, it's much more uniform because the milk is stored cold. In many cases, it's pasteurized. We use the same amount of rennet. But if you're working in a more heritage system, traditional system, that's going to be something you'll think about. And you know, on and on through through the list here, um, we can use these higher temperatures when we have this lactobacilli and streptococci. Uh, 
that are going to be activated. And then when we get to the draining away, the, the lower the, the pH is or the higher the titratal acidity is when we drain away, the less buffering there's going to be in the curd and the cheddaring will go faster. So we're going to have to be altering the way we cheddar, which is the turning and piling of the blocks of, of, of curd, uh, depending on what our, what our acidity is at drain. Um, and finally, when we mill the curds um, into chips and uh, we, we apply the salt, that's a critical juncture. Um, we can create a stronger flavored cheese when there's more acid in the curd at that time. Salt amount, very important because we can't just weigh the curd if we're making these larger vats of cheese. We have to really have a sense of how much we're, cheese we're getting out of this milk. And then we have to predict how much, I mean, not predict, we have to adjust the amount of salt we add to try to end up with a uniform salt level in the cheese. Um, and finally, um, last couple of slides, just to sort of uh, sum up what, uh, you know, I've read about the, the sensory properties of these old method uh, or, you know, older world cheeses, cheddars, um, which I think is really interesting and important to talk about because that's sort of where some of the more veteran cheesemakers who, who still work with raw milk are at these days. They're like, I've even heard this from West Country cheesemakers, or I've seen it. You know, there's evidence that they're going back to learn these old ways and reinvent the wheel, so to speak, as I got some of these descriptions from this book that is all about that. And it's about how to make, bring the, the flavor of the past back into the cheese, the flavor of the land back into the cheese. So cheeses with, with supple uh, body texture, you know, not so flaky and uh, crumbly, more of a rounded flavor, a little nuttiness, uh, not, not as a, a different mouthfeel. Um, and then when we go to the, the modern traditional, the West Country style, we, we get these flavors that are characterized as complex, robust, earthy, some a little bit of caramel, a little tiny bit of sweet, but a lot of savoriness and, and horseradish with a streak of that fresh acidity from the lactic acid that's that still remains in the cheese. The you know the texture of the West Country cheeses are, are a little on the crumblier, flakier side. And that's a, a direct contrast to the old, very slow method of, of getting the curd to milling, where you still have the suppleness in the curd and it leads to these cheeses that have that sort of texture versus a, a more crumbly texture. And finally, when we get to industrial, uh, we're looking at these lower TAs. Uh, you know, this is the way I learned how to make it. And at Shelburne Farms, we were, we were gunning to make more of a English style cheddar. So we did go for a 0.65 TA at milling, uh, not way down a 0.40 to make a mild cheese. Um, we did have medium cheddar at six months, sharp at 12 and extra sharp at 18. We didn't have any cheese on the market at three months. It just, it, it was, it was not ready yet. And so that's in direct contrast to your fast industrial cheese that uh, is, is really on the market. And you're, you can buy it at three months. And, and what they're doing is they're grading it out here in the final three bullet points based on the moisture content. They may even make bats, especially for extra sharp, for sharp, for medium, but they're grading it out based on the moisture and the salt and the pH, where the pH lies about a week after uh, it's, it was made. And you can see how the, the TA choice uh, and also the, the, the dryness of the curd, the moisture content of the curd really shapes the uh, ability of that cheese to become a extra sharp, sharp or medium with different flavor profiles. Up here in, in New England and New York, we love bitey cheese. We love cheese that has a strong flavor and uh, even young people like it. People that, you know, that grow up here like it. So that's just an aspect of, of living in this region. Um, and I, so we probably won't change the way we make 
uh, cheddar by and large here. But what I what I wanted to um, end up with now that I'm going to ask you if you have some questions is just that there's the ability now for anyone who knows cheddar well to go back and 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 reinvent the wheel to to uh, research about. Uh, maybe go to Somerset and see how they're making it and research and find out uh, how these slower making methods affect the quality of the cheese and make, you know, different kinds of cheddar in your uh, creamery. So I will open it up to questions. I'm going to open up the chat. There we go. So fire away. If you don't have any, I'm just going to go back and talk about some other stuff. <laughs> well, she, there's a question there, but remember, you have to read it. Why does cheddar not have a DOP like some European cheeses? Uh, it is. What? Keep reading. Oh, okay. and is the cheddar name likely to be affected by the geographical indicators review of cheese names? I highly doubt it because cheddar, as far back as the 17th century, spread into the colonies and was made there and then became a dominant cheese in the colonies and then the new United States. Um, I think that, you know, the English claim to that, it's, it's, it's kind of uh, way too late to stir the pot on that. They, they were effective and they did get a win on that with Stilton. So I don't know, I Rachel's thought that, I thought that there was a I thought that there was a, um, I thought that some of those cheddars had there well, there may be a what what you could do is do a West con Country I think there might cheddar be DOP. Well, there is a slow food presidio, which yeah. is is like in an international stage, is kind of like that. I mean, it's but it's acknowledging that. that this is a special uh kind of production and you know it's it's got its rules and it it's not like you know it it is it is a certain process, just like the other slow food presidios but it doesn't have the legal teeth yeah of the, yeah the it's just an acknowledgement yeah. yeah um by you know an international community of food lovers that are trying to preserve some of these heritage uh, uh foods you know raw foods and also uh cheeses so i have a question rachel has a question <laughs> Um, I just was, as I was listening to you, I was having some thoughts and one of them was, I'm wondering if the addition um, or advent of um, LH of the Lactobacillus helveticus um, could also be not just a result of American palates, but also um, an attempt to try and make industrial cheeses more interesting. Yeah. I mean, I'm just thinking about the, the slide that a couple slides back where you were talking about uh, um, that the shorter age cheeses, the milder cheeses, maybe not having as much flavor. And so that maybe that was a... Well, the thing about the Helveticus that's interesting is that it, it's a thermophilic bacteria. Um, if you're working with pasteurized milk, like the majority of American cloth bound cheddars are made from it, uh, you're going to have to um, uh, it, it, you're going to activate um, the uh, the Streptococcus thermophilus really well in the vat because it's the the main acidifying thermophilic bacteria that's used in all Italian cheese making, you know, hard Alpine cheese making, and so uh, so it's going to be active in the vat. But what we're talking about is not that. We're talking about Lactobacillus helveticus and other kinds of lactobacilli that their role is during aging and you cannot push them as far as I know. Now, I know very little about the uh, high powered, uh, you know, industrial cheddar making with the most cutting edge science to get cheddar, you know, to market quick that has interesting flavor. And you know that's being done with other cheeses, so you can shorten the aging process. And I'm sure you know you can do that. But the thing about Lactobacillus helveticus is you're looking at you know some months, nine months before mm -hmm. you really get the flavor from it. So the American cloth bound cheddars are like one year age cheeses. You know they're they're 
they're similar to the West Country cheddars and they, they do age them that long. Um, I, just before you go on, you just reminded me of uh, when we were out in Oregon, that there was a woman who was a cheese technologist and she had spent, I think, 10 years trying to figure out how to get the crystals mm -hmm. in the three month cheeses. Yeah. And they were actually able to do it. But the problem was that the cheese had no flavor. Ah, and the crystals are developing in but by the action of the lactobacillus bacteria. And, you know, there, there are some benign lactobacilli that survive pasteurization. These are the, the thermoresistant bacteria that are part of the cheddar flavor. So, uh, so, you know, we have that as an interest as well. So, but anyways, let's, let's, we'll let's do, a... there's a bunch now. Okay. How about if I read it to you and you can answer? Okay. There will be changes due to the milk flavor and microflora and then cultures, but is there more, are there more differences from the methods? So the question seems to be, are the, uh, the milk treatment and cultures uh, have, a, have a larger or profound effect than the, the, the methods, the steps, like where we just decide to, to pitch the curd, settle the curd, where we decide to add the rennet, where we decide to drain away, where we decide to mill the curd. Yeah. Uh, wow, you know, because, Things like temperature and acidity do govern the way microbes grow. I would say that the uh, the methods are really key. Like without good attention to method, you're not going to get the bacteria that you're hoping are going to make this cheese turn out with the right flavor and texture to work as well. So you have to you have to adapt your methods to the the milk treatment and to the cultures, I would say. Jenny asked, uh, how long does it take for cheese crystals to form? Well, it depends on the temperature the cheese ages at. And you can have, like even in a cheese that's that's six months old, you can have, if you've aged it at say 60 degrees, you can have actually some very large, not so pleasant crystals in cheese. But the classic lovely crystals that people love, um, well, in our cheeses, they're taking about uh, a year and a half at the least. And, uh, but the average is more like two years yeah, for really cheeses does. we make. But, but, you know, again, it's complicated. It has to do with how, how much of a population of lactobacilli you have in the milk, whether it's raw milk or pasteurized milk, because you're going to have more of these bacilli if it's pasteurized milk. I mean, raw milk, excuse me, and things like that. So there's no, not an easy answer, but it is a sign of, of a long age cheese, you know, a cheese that's approaching a year and even going over a year. Uh, next one. In Australia and New Zealand, a significant development in, 19, in the 1980s was the use of ultrafiltration for increasing and standardizing protein levels during the season. This yields a consistent product throughout the year. In the past, were customers happy with seasonal variations in flavor, body, and texture, but still classified as cheddar? Oh, so what I gained in my reading was um, when you move through the 20th century, uh, you know, it, it, things got sort of twisted too because like the, the old style cheese was really, in a, was really not to be found very easily. And so what you had on the market was, was much more industrial cheese. And, you know, the, this big group of Somerset cheesemakers, they, they were not making as much cheese during those years, like the middle of the 20th century. And so what I was reading was that the actual, the, the younger generations of consumers liked the milder cheeses. They, they weren't all that interested in in uh, cheese that had stronger flavor and, um, or, you know, more complex flavor. And so uh, I, I think that um, the customers in the past, they would be seeking out their favorite cheese and they were probably really happy when they got it because they may not all have lived in an area where, you know, they could get the finest cheese because there was more variation. But I think there were enough good cheesemakers that people that had distinction of, of you know, taste 
and wanted to find very well-made cheese, they could get it. But I do think that, um, that we're looking at a gradual progression towards milder tasting foods in general. And cheese is just one of those that's, that's in the cart. Um, what we find is, is very small, you know, part of the market is now eager, right? For the complexity, for the, what, what was that cheese? I want to taste something like that. I think people have different expectations depending on what, uh, what they're going to be using the cheese for, you know, what their intentions are. Um, folks who are looking for something that is mild, something that is going to be very consistent. Um, that's, that's a different buying or, you know, a different, yeah. a different set of, of um, desires uh, on the part of consumers than the folks who are looking for the, the, the West County cheeses or some of these smaller scale raw milk cheeses. But I do think that uh, mongers, cheesemongers, cheese shop owners, and even distributors <coughs> are better equipped to handle seasonal variation and some of the um, interesting changes that happen with these, with raw milk cheeses. Yeah, like, like here, for example, the Shelburne Farms, <laughs> which makes uh, raw milk cheddar, that's all they make. And they, they have a herd of 120 brown Swiss milking cows and they're on pasture in the classic sense here, which is six months, although they're on the big lake, Lake Champlain. So they get a little bit longer than most of us in Vermont because it's a little more temperate. Um, and then, you know, they go to the winter feed. And so they have different quality of flavor based on the feed in the cows, the cows are getting. And, and um, but that that cheese is a very good gateway cheese for a lot of pe people that like fine cheese and will like to eat some cheddar from now time to time. Uh, to being curious about the West Country cheddar, the Somerset cheddar, because we can get Montgomery's cheddar here. We can get West, West Cone. Cone cheddar. We just bought some at a shop that's an hour from here the other day. Uh, so. That's what's really interesting and sort of, um, I think, exciting is that the shops are now getting a bit wider of a variety of cheddars uh, rather than, you know, just having the same old, so, which is sort of that baseline cheddar that like, you know, it's, it's uh, what do you call it? Uh, it's um, approachable. It's like everyone likes it. It's well made. Um, Jenny yeah. also has a comment here. Much of the cheddar produced here in Australia in the 60s to 80s was exported back to England. Mm. Um, all we grew up with was craft processed cheese, which tastes ah, like plastic. That's so funny. That's the same thing here. I mean, that was certainly growing up. Yeah. yeah I mean, Peter. Well, I, I, I was lucky because I grew up in Vermont and in all the country stores, the general stores, there was actually raw milk cheddar, cloth bound, but paraffined. So they, they kept the cloth on from what it had been pressed in and they paraffined it. Paraffin is somewhat breathable. So it had a real bite. Now, I'll never forget that. You know, I can't even get cheese like that anymore. Uh, I mean, I haven't been able to for a long time because that's what happened was it just the market for it, I imagine dwindled and, or, or you know, you know, the other thing to think about is that the marketing people themselves in these companies, they can sh make a product and then, you know, subject the consumer to it and get them to switch. <laughs> Force them and I think that's what happened because like, you know, even Cabot Cheddar, which back then, you know, that's what I'm talking about. They were one of the brands in the, co the country store, the general store that we ate on a regular basis. Our fancy cheese were those little processed cheese wedges from Switzerland. Uh, that was like a big deal. To get laughing a, cow? Yeah, a box of those things. But we ate a lot of cheddar and, you know, that flavor's kind of gone away, except for the Shelburne Farms Extra Sharp, which has a good bite to it. Um, so, yeah, I think that's, that's where we're at. Yeah, very interested to find out more about the cheddar that's being made now 
Yeah, well, we're running out of time now, but if people would like to hear more Peter speak further on Cheddar, I'd really appreciate your feedback on that. So we know whether to run with that um, next semester. So yeah, again, I put it I, in I, the sorry, chat box or email me. That would be terrific. Thank you. Yeah, I was just going to reiterate that it was going to be more of a, a technical type webinar looking at the picking apart the process okay so with that um i'll just say thank you very much peter and we're blessed with rachel's company as well today so of thank course you so much. lovely <laughs>